do an experiment. 200 slides, quarter of a gigabyte, in half an hour. <laughs> so this was a milestone at this meeting. DR25, the final catalog from the mission. There won't be another from the mission, but it's not the end. Very impressive piece of work, though. There were 24 before this. And then I loved the highlights from Jason Rowe. Well, but he left out one or two of my favorites, so I'm going to tell you about those. A system of three stars. Every one of them goes in front of every other one sooner or later. And that introduced me to the idea of a photodynamical analysis, analysis that can give you precise radii and masses without needing any spectroscopy. Wait a minute, doesn't need spectroscopy? Well, you can help with spectroscopy. And then Kepler 36, which really should have been Kepler 42, Natalie, because the period ratio is very close to 6 to 7. Imagine. <laughs> Kepler 42, the answer to all the secrets of the universe. <laughs> so you see one of them is quite deep, and the other is very shallow. And I love this invention of the river plot, where you stack up all the uh, transit events. And if you look carefully, you see uh, seven times around on the left-hand one is a big bump six times around in the uh, other one. And that gave us very precise masses for the first time, and very different densities. Factor of eight, Trappist one, how can you not love that system? And I love the heroic story of chasing down the transit event for H, that was wonderful. Thank you, Spitzer. Now K2 uh, was community driven, so there are lots of M dwarfs. And Miss M dwarf took on the job of characterizing these M dwarfs and found out that, well, half of them are actually M dwarfs and the others you don't want to spend your time on. And Andrew was able to tell us about this mar marvelous system, WASP 47, observed in campaign three of K2, with a giant planet with a period of four days and little planets on either side. So far, it's the only one we know like this, but I think we'd better find more. And this gives, again, very precise and hopefully accurate masses. Down here, very nice error bars, and the other one up there. So you can talk about formation and so on. Dennis, great talk, I love that. Uh, telling us about the astroseismic revolution. And Kepler giving us 600 dwarfs, 20,000 giants with astroseismology and the exciting future of space cool star astroseismology. He was talking about cool stars. Oh, and you have, you learn things from astroseismology that I'm not sure you want to learn about <laughs> magnetic fields. <laughs> oh, well, this is interesting. Uh, rotation down inside the star. I love this diagram, this movie of how the uh, mode splitting tells you about the uh, rotation in the core. And how about comparing that to the rotation at the surface? Well, they don't agree very well. The core rotates more rapidly than the surface. And how do you get between them? Well, I had to show this because there you see a uh, comparison with Maserati and Latham, 2008. <laughs> I didn't know anybody had ever read the paper. <laughs> And then you need to uh, worry about uh, metal poor stars. So Kevin told us about that. Great work displayed at this meeting from the California Kepler survey. And Eric Cartagora started the kickoff of that, but we saw it coming back again and again. You have to know your star. You have to know something about the size of the star. More of this from Rob Wittemeyer from Down Under. And then we came to uh, surface gravities. Now again, from the uh, oscillations, in this case, the granulation in the uh, Kepler data. Uh, very nice to see uh, the jitter being now a little bit more carefully quantified in terms of uh, the power spectrum. And other work. Just using the Kepler light curves, all you need to know is Kepler's third law, and from the shape, the 
duration of the light curve, you can tell a lot. Oh, you better know if there's nearby companions, stars. And several people have worked on that. Here you see a couple of the oral papers and then uh, one of the posters, Robo AO. Supernovae. Remarkable to see light curves of supernovae that catch the beginning because you're staring at the field and you see it coming up so quickly, just like beads on a string. Remarkable. Too bad we don't get spectra when you're in a trailing uh, pointing in order to classify what kind of a supernova you have. Well, that's the reason for kegs and a forward-looking campaign, campaign 16, and well, if we get there, campaign 17, where you can uh, get ground-based observations more or less simultaneously once you know what to look at and that Kepler is getting. In the solar system, I learned about Trojan asteroids, different number on both sides, these crazy ones called Hilder asteroids. And uh, Andras showed us some tour de force work going to 22nd, 23rd magnitude with Kepler. Can you imagine that? Oh, and microlensing. Kalen talked about the uh, microlensing campaign nine. Here are the science goals. Some marvelous animations he had of how the parallax, the satellite parallax works, which really helps you uh, get the masses of the targets, of the uh, candidates. And then uh, early work dealing with the data from the Mike and Lensing campaign. I like this. It's hard, but solvable. And to prove it, there is a solution. And working together with Spitzer makes it even more powerful. Some nice ideas on the theoretical side by Ruth, which is where I first saw this diagram that then reappeared later, a highlight of the meeting in my opinion, for this evaporation gap and the observations supporting that. And John Brewer, after years of work, doing marvelous work on abundance patterns. I guess there's a lot of rock and gravel because that's the piles on the screen. And silicon is showing a correlation here. You need silicon in order to make the, uh, the multiples, the, the packed multis to make rocky planets. Oh, do we understand the 17-year-old problem of inflated hot Jupiters? Well, not yes, I guess not yet, but there's two more examples to add to that. Seeing double with K2, testing reinflation. And Vincent asking, where are the short period planets orbiting evolved stars? There's progress on that recently, and Vincent showed a few examples. And this gives me an opportunity to show you Ashley, who has been looking at astro seismology of exoplanet host stars. That is KOI-4, so that's the first new planet candidate found by Kepler. And there's the astro seismology, see all the oscillations. But two weeks ago, I got a message from Daniel uh, about this work by Ashley. Any chance we could get some velocities? One week ago, I sent him this orbit. This is a uh, certified five Jupiter mass planet. So, I guess you'd have to say that was Kepler's first planet. Or last. Or last. No, it's not its last. There'll be more. So, this is not Kepler 4, Bill. This is KOI 4. Bill's the lead author in Kepler 4. Oh, and a wonderful movie that we, kind of wacky this movie that we saw, uh, talking about galactic archaeology and how we can understand the Milky Way from. Uh, many different sides, but uh, especially having the input of astro seismology. So the light curves from Kepler and K2 are really impressive. Mind the gap, well I like that, so I showed this one. Because uh, it again reinforces the kind of information that you use from Kepler and K2 uh, to get the surface gravities, not just astro seismology, but once again the granulation is coming in. And uh, 
putting together information from many different sources, spectroscopy. Uh, you add the age dimension with astroseismology and learn about the origin of the Milky Way. And Mark, a uh, very nice summary of the sample of 415 <laughs> subgiants and dwarfs with apogee. Although you see they tend to be more massive than the sun. The sun's down here at the corner of this pseudo HR diagram. Future looks really bright for this with combination of information from Gaia and TESS. Uh, zillions of <laughs> seismic measurements. Ruth is taking on another difficult challenge, getting the ages of K dwarfs uh, with some fresh ideas, but she's not there yet. Oh, and a really interesting panel discussion that we had uh, with Dennis Overby and Nadia Drake. I didn't know she was related to Frank. And uh, Michael Lemonick, organized by Michelle. I really enjoyed that. If you didn't go there, you missed a, a good time. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get a better picture of Connie, who is talking about now the hotter stars in astroseismology. She talked about the O and B stars, but you see other members of the group that gave their talks in other parts of the hot part of the HR diagram. Ooh, man, these O B stars, they are complicated. There's going to be years of work figuring out uh, the frequencies and what it implies about the stars. And uh, Gamma Doradus stars, good progress there. Uh, B stars, Tim White. I liked his original Latin quotations from Siderius Nuncius, for example. Uh, and Lazlo asking, why do we care about Cepheids? Well, Cepheids in uh, a nearby galaxy in the local group, 20th magnitude. Amazing. And JJ talked about uh, rapid rotation in a white dwarf. But the thing that I noticed in his talk was this business of outbursts, a surprising discovery with Kepler of aperiodic outbursts in ZZ Cephei. Oh, Chris Burke, talking about the past, current, and future of planet occurrence rates. A very nice summary of the history. But the key is trying to figure out what's going on in this corner where we're bedeviled by uh, completeness issues and reliability issues. A lot more work to go on there. But you see, uh, a lot of the issues, the systematic effects, have been retired. They have lines through them. <laughs> and Danley, well, he got the first results. What did he have 10 days ago, two days ago? And he'd already run things through and shown that uh, his way of doing the analysis is giving a current rates already. I was impressed. Ian, working with the citizen science projects. Uh, marvelous that you guys were able to do this. Uh, it may get out of control in the future, but you're going to find out. Uh, and one of the things I noticed is you show a nice plot about uh, how everybody is enamored with M dwarfs. No, I'm not going to go there. I was going to tell a story about the arguments that we had, whether we ought to do G K G2 dwarfs or we could do smaller stars with Kepler mission. Yeah, well, we sure added them. Well, that's why I ended up doing the Kepler input catalog, to make sure they got in. <laughs> and, uh, oh, there's the event where you had the spike of uh, interest in citizen science as evidenced by XOFOP uh, access. And, uh, well, Ambitious future plans, more power to you. Sounds like great fun. And uh, Steve Bryson talking about what we can learn from looking very carefully at the uh, false positives and uh, maybe even seeing some evidence of uh, extra nearby companions uh, to planet hosting stars that we haven't really understood before. There's more there. And uh, Trent, uh, well, not Trent. Uh, Adam Krauss, who was working with Trent, Trent was one of my humble fellows, sorry. Uh, the ruinous influence of closed binaries on planetary systems is you get inside of, what is it, 50 AU or something, uh, they can make a problem. 
But Kepler is great because it didn't have any selection against those binaries, so they're included there. Oh, I had to show this because uh, this type of observation at the bottom, you know how they do that? They cover up most of the mirror of Keck, little holes here and there. Oy. But it works. <laughs> okay, there are the takeaway points. How am I doing? I'm almost halfway through. Almost halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mass radius relations. Yeah, you can still uh, predict something, but it's not a major <laughs> diagram. And uh, this is the, uh, on the observational side anyway, the highlight to the, of the meeting to me because of uh, how it allows some ideas to be confirmed. Uh, with this particular plot looking very much like the predictions that you heard about today. Eric talking about evaporation. You see all the ones up here in the upper left hand corner. Understand TTV versus uh, Doppler uh, radio velocity masses and if you take into account period properly it all works. Uh, Luke is showing that Kepler-19 gives the same results on both sides. Oh, clusters. I wish I could spend more time on clusters. Very interesting results on uh, how clusters spin down. Uh, price to be being old enough so you see this kind of equilibrium line here. But stuff on the low mass side and the high mass side that hadn't seen, been seen before. Uh, working on rotation periods at old cluster. Thank you, Tim, for uh, saying that you shouldn't apologize for being careful <laughs> because Rebecca's careful. And a uh, uh, very important cluster in the K2 data uh, that Jason Curtis talked about. And we heard about flare rates. And there's a template for flares. Whoa, did I hit the wrong one? Yes. Jennifer, very nice talk. Uh, insights into angular momentum evolution. We still have a lot to learn here. Uh, but astro seismology tells you about the surface. I'm sorry, about the internal. And photometry tells you about the surface. Okay, lots to worry about there. Ibor is still trying to figure out how to model light curves and figure out. <laughs> well, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I sympathize. <laughs> and uh, physical properties of star spots, especially at the uh, young age. Uh, stars are more spotted than we used to think. Then showing how you uh, can get access to the full frame images. And there's Tabby Star, just to show it works. And uh, David Ciardi uh, talking about the variability patterns. And F and G stars are the quietest. But even the quiet ones are noisy from time to time. And uh, Ganji talking about the circumbinary planets, some really interesting insights into whether the pileup is real or uh, just kind of a selection effect. And uh, whether the distribution of circumbinary planets is like single star systems or not. Uh, Dan's talks always fascinate me, and they're so clear, I think the next day I'm going to remember all that. And guess what? I don't remember all that the next day, but they show marvelous things. Look at these numbers over here. These are the super duper, well, went over the super duper periods of 490 days. Really deep understanding of what's going on in Trappist 1. And uh, another Dan, oh, this is his poster. So the issue is whether you have Jupiters in order to migrate in or halt the migrating in of small planets. And with the Jupiter, the migration is blocked. And what can you tell about the uh, Kepler-11 system because of that? Jerry Rose, now this is amazing to me also that he can model, do photodynamically, uh, dynamical modeling uh, so carefully. And one case, it's actually beginning to pay off with uh, tidal K values. Avi, talking about heartbeat stars <clears throat> and how there's evidence that things have evolved onto this envelope for these extreme, uh, very eccentric orbits. And Jim Fuller talking about an extreme case, 
where even with a small planet, uh, there can be a big impact from tidal dissipation. Evan, now talking about the key product project that has led to so many new mass determinations, mass radius diagram filling out. Similar work by Bill Cochran with a different collaboration. Four interesting cases. You can see they were involving uh, HD3167. And marvelous interpretation, uh, pre-interpretation of the evaporation valley from James Owen and how it works, whether you're on the left side or the right side of this uh, upside down uh, quadratic, and uh, explaining why we see the evaporation valley in the observations, I think, just beautifully. Of course, we're going to need to learn more and figure out what the slope of that valley is. Water roots don't exist. Cores must have formed inside the snow line must have formed in a gas disk. All these conclusions from this result, this is remarkable. Oh, and Lauren, uh, talking about her peas in the pod, the multis, uh, showing patterns there. And Sarah, nice job on uh, looking at phase curves in order to predict where there might be non-transiting giant planets, not, not outer planets. These are going to be right down in uh, the uh, short periods that hot Jupiter's show, all they need now is RV follow-up of 15th and 16th magnitude stars. <laughs> and Bill Welch, the hidden gift of Kepler, non-transiting circumbinary planets. Uh, one in particular uh, is now yielding interesting results. Still some work to do on the others. Raphael explaining uh, some of the things that the Harps North team has learned about how you should organize your observations and how you really must try to cover the activity cycle, which means we're going to need to collaborate more or else have our own telescopes. And here are, is a summary of those lessons learned. Fabien talking about uh, light curves as predictors of good RV targets, and uh, something was put together apparently last night by her graduate student showing recent results uh, for F-stars. Hunting for these dippers with machine techniques, machine learning, 95 new dippers. Willary Makarov had a stand-in talking about astrometry. We sure wanted to do, we hoped we could do astrometry with Kepler, but it wasn't to be. The old rule of thumb that if you need to do good photometry, you can also do good astrometry, but not at the level that we were hoping to do. Uh, and then Tabby Star, where there really is comets or not, I don't know, the idea of seven comets coming back around again 400 years, days later, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Oh, and our two uh, uh, poster winners, Brett Morris and Faye Dye, congratulations to them. And apologies to Eric, George, and Jesse, because there was no way I could take pictures of them and get them into this review. Do I have another three minutes? Sure. Because <laughs> I always like to say a little bit about going forward uh, with Kepler. So DR25 is the final mission catalog, but much work remains. A lot of it is going to depend on stellar characterization. Gaia is going to have an enormous impact. We're going to see all kinds of spectroscopy from large surveys contributing. Uh, TTV work should not stop. There will be opportunities to get additional timings from space and ground photometry. I think improved false positive bedding is going to have an impact. Uh, this business of confirming that false positive candidates based on the Kepler data uh, is confirmed by additional information is important, and we're also going to rescue planets. We don't have to rescue Kepler 10b, but there's going to be others that we rescue. <laughs> and uh, we're going to see a lot of work on occurrence rates. We're going to see progress measuring masses of small planets with future instruments, and we're going to see lots of new ideas, especially from the young people in the room. Beyond Kepler, the K2 campaigns and the follow-up work for K2 targets will take years of work. 
We have Tess and Chaos and Plato, or Plato if you're French, will distract many of us. And of course, there's the whole promise of the atmospheres of exoplanets with JWST and the ground. We've got to push mass determinations to the limit. I don't know how well that's going to work. And then W first and the direct imaging missions. That's about as far as I'm going to look ahead because I'm not as young as most of the people in this room. Thank you. you, you see.